Welcome to Fables of Our Deconstruction, a podcast where we examine our systems of faith and culture together as we grow as people. I'm your host, Dylan. If you like what you hear, be sure to check me out at patreon.com slash Dylan. If you'd like to be on a future episode, leave me a message over at 515-318-7569 or find Fables of Our Deconstruction on Anchor FM and send me a voice message. If you want your name shared, include it in your message. Otherwise, I'll keep you anonymous. Now let's deconstruct. It is nearly the end of March, and I cannot tell you how both good and terrifying that feels. The entirety of my April will be spent on the road for both conventions and vacation. I am looking forward to that. I'll be home most weekdays, but gone most weekends, and those weekends will be three to four days long, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel like a lot. Uh, and to add to the n- numerous wide breadth of things I'm doing, I, I'm trying to bring back my TikTok. I barely ever used it. I was I was posting some artwork on there. I'm thinking about posting my art on there again, but the thing I want to bring it back for is to do, like, snippets of skepticism and snippets of, uh, like, Critical faith, <laughs> critical faith theory. That would have been a great name for a podcast, <laughs> especially right now. Uh, but uh, I, I just want to tell you a little anecdote about something that took place on there. I was watching modern day debates on YouTube and wound up watching an old debate with um, Kent Hovind. Uh, he's a creationist. He specifically purports that humans and dinosaurs existed simultaneously, young earth theory, stuff like that. And he, he basically mentioned that science is just observational. It's only what you can observe, which is why uh, he wants to say that any science that makes predictions of the past um, or makes observations of the past through things like the geol- like g- g- the geology record um that uh that that stuff's historical science it's a soft science he says so i kind of came back at him with uh, uh, uh one of my first new tiktoks and i was like hey man if you have to have seen it how do you know you picked the right god how do you know that all the events in the bible that you're adhering to took place that seems circular and it seems like you're not able to observe it please let me know like I said, come at me. And he just said, God made circles, so circles are good. And that felt like a really weak argument. So I don't know how involved I'll be on TikTok. I'll be trying uh, my best to be on there and do a few things, but trying to figure out exactly where I land in the world of skepticism and creativity. So we'll we'll be working that stuff out. So, we're moving into something exciting today. I got an email from a listener. I'm really excited to read it to you. Uh, They asked that I keep their name out of it, so we're going to do that. But they also included audio of a sermon uh, that they gave in college. So, I'm going to include that file as well. But I think what we're going to do is we're going to play the sermon, and then I'll read to you their email, okay? So we'll move on from there, and we'll start off with this sermon. I feel a little short. How clever. There we go. Um, I just want to bring everyone's attention to the title of my sermon today. It's called, How Do We Know? And I chose this title because a lot of times throughout, like, just my time here at Augie, I've been struggling with this. Like, how do I really know that God exists? How do I know that his word's true? Especially with my biology major, um, we teach a lot about, you know, evolution and just the idea of evolution. Well, how does God fit into that and what I'm learning? And then it's all those Job moments. You know, we all have those struggles. You know, how do we really know? Because God gives us all these challenges. I mean, lately there's a lot of people I know that are um, being diagnosed with cancer, and it's just hard because these are really great people, and yet God's choosing or 
it's just happening in their fate that they have cancer now and they're probably not going to survive or hopefully they will survive and all these challenges. And something else that brought it up to my attention is that when I was in Wales, I studied abroad um, in my junior year and I was posed with my flatmates. We were literally just sitting around having a great time and of course um, over there it's not a bad idea to talk about religion. When here in the U.S. it's such a big problem, you know, you don't talk about religion at the dinner table, but for them it's okay. And so we started talking about religion and they looked at me and they're like, well, how do you know? Why do you believe? And this was such a struggle for me because being in the U.S. and growing up, you know, in a Christian family, I don't know. I just believe. And I just knew it. So it kind of just reminded me of the Doubting Thomas story, which I'm going to read for you a portion of it right now. But Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in, the, in his side, I will not believe. This idea was just kind of brought to me, because my flatmates were like this. They had to know God was there. They had to see it. They had to feel it. They had to know. And so while we're all, you know, sitting around having a good time, and I just told them my story, how I knew. And to be honest, I didn't know for my, the longest time. And sometimes I still struggle with it today. But... What really helped me out is my freshman year here at college, I, my great-grandma was struggling. And she, uh, well, I started to pray for her. And for one thing, prayer was new for me. I mean, I know you're supposed to pray all the time, but I really didn't pray because I don't know why. I just didn't. So one day I just sat down and decided, I'm going to pray. And let me tell you, it scared the bejeebus out of me because... All of a sudden, someone was talking back to me. I mean, it happened, and I was so scared. <laughs> so I stopped praying for a little while because it scared me. And then my grandma started getting even worse. Um, she was 98, and but you have to realize that I grew up with her. She was my other mom. She raised me, too. And I just wanted her to get better. I wanted to be able to go home that summer and see her and be able to spend time with her again. And so I did it again. I prayed. <laughs> but this time, I really sat down and I really concentrated and prayed. And I asked God, please take her pain away. And a week later, she passed away. <laughs> so I was mad. I was so upset with God because, yeah, I asked for her pain to be taken away, but... That's not what I meant. I did not want her to pass away. I was supposed to see her that summer, you know, spend time with her. It didn't happen. And, you know, I was really angry with God, and we struggled back and forth. I didn't pray again for a while. And then, about a week after her funeral, I had a rugby match. And the story I'm telling my flatmates at this time is just, I got hurt at the rugby match. I, my leg was all swollen. I got stepped on. I was lucky I didn't break my leg. And well, though at the time it didn't seem like it, but I started really thinking about this. Because when I had prayed to God, I told him, please take her pain away. Give it to me. I'll take all of her pain. And I did. Um, my leg got swollen, and my grandma had lots of troubles with her legs. Her legs were full of pain, and I just wanted her to be able to walk again and enjoy walking. And so... I wanted to take her pain away. And at this rugby match, I got hurt, and I don't know if any of you know or saw me at that time, but my leg was probably about the size of a softball, if not a, you know, it was really big and all bruised, and I couldn't walk. And that was kind of like her pain that I had taken away, and God had taken it from her and placed it on me. So he did what I asked, but not in the way I thought it would happen. And you think by this time I would be believing in God, you know, Hey, he answered my prayer. Not in the way I expected, but he did answer it. And honestly, I didn't care at that point. I decided, you know, yeah, he answered it for a second or two, but maybe that's not going to be there forever. So I kind of stopped believing again, which I probably shouldn't have. But then I came back to him. My boyfriend Jesse and I were having such a hard time. 
you know, I'm here, he's seven hours away, and I didn't know what to do. We were fighting, it was a hard time, so I went and I prayed again. And by this time, I was like, no way is God going to answer me, because I prayed to him once, he showed himself, and I didn't believe it. And then, here he is, he showed himself again. Things got better. I prayed, things got better. And that's just the story I told my friends. I mean, I knew because he showed himself to me. And for a lot of people, I mean, sure, maybe it's just a coincidence, and that's why I told my flatmates. And I didn't expect them to really, you know, be changed by it, but it was just my whole story that that's how I know God that exists, that no matter what, even if there's some doubts in you, and some, I mean, it is good to doubt and wonder, but you have to realize sometimes God's going to answer our prayers in ways that you wouldn't expect. That even when someone's hurting and you pray for them to get better, maybe to get better is just to be with God. That you might end up getting hurt in the same way that you're hoping not to get hurt. But the whole point is that God answers us in many different ways, and that even the sense of doubt can be there, but God's still going to come back and be there too. And that really helped me. Like, now you can question faith all you want around me, but I know still. And it should help people know that, that even if you doubt, it's okay to doubt, and God's going to be there. He's going to be with you all the way long in that doubt. It, through all those moments like Job went through, he's going to be there with you. And that his arms are always going to encircle us, and he's going to provide that support that we need and that we should always have and need. Thank you. All right, so that's the sermon that was sent to me by our listener. Now, I've got the email that they've requested I read, but I want to remind you, in order to keep them anonymous, I'm going to be reading it for them. So from this point forward, I'll be reading on their behalf until I conclude. Attached is my senior sermon from college. It was a last-minute decision to host a senior sermon, and I was lucky to have gotten a time. There was just something that compelled me to share this story with people. I listened to that senior sermon now, nine years from when I gave it, and I'm sharing it with you. I don't identify as atheist, and I don't identify as Christian. I'm not sure where I land, though I like to say that I land in a realm of spiritualism, whatever that means. But to me, it means respecting all life and acknowledging that life has a place and a purpose. That all living things have a spirit, but not in the sense of a ghostly thing, more of the ability to respond to the world around them. So, more of a scientific concept of life. Basically, I don't believe in a god or the Christian god anymore. So why did I believe? Well, my senior sermon stated it. I was brought up in a Christian family. No one went to church but me. And I don't exactly disagree with what I said, and I still agree with the main message. It's okay to question. It's okay to question and believe. It's okay to question and have doubt. And it's okay to question and not believe. A miraculous answer came when I needed it most. Now, I realize I was playing rugby. Rugby is a dangerous sport, and playing any sport increases your chance of injury. It was happenstance that it occurred in the way that it did, and that my leg got injured, causing the pain to be taken away from my great-grandmother, which my great-grandma had troubles with her legs. Today, I don't actually believe God took the pain away from her. She was 98 years old. I was a young person that was selfish and trying to take care of a family member that was far away. I was grieving. People die, and old people die. My great-grandma was experiencing end of life, and I don't understand what death was or how that worked. I encourage everyone to read about death and end of life. It might make you more comfortable with loss, and I understand more now. Also, the reason my now ex-boyfriend and I fought was because we didn't talk about the things that mattered. It wasn't prayer that ended the fight I was talking about. It was the fact that we finally talked, that we finally listened to each other and accepted some disagreements. Side note, I'm not with him anymore. 
it would have been it would have never worked out because we didn't discuss religion we didn't discuss abortion and we didn't question anything together these are the things that need to be a part of a relationship prayer would only work 50 percent of the time but being open-minded and using discussion can work 80 percent of the time those odds those are better why don't i believe now i left college and took a job in an area that's quite religious to give you an idea Nothing is open on Sundays, and my students would beg for Christian music to be played in the classroom, although I taught at a public school. Before me taking over the science position, creationism was taught as a scientific concept instead of evolution. This was, and still is, against the law in a public school setting. I'm sure you could imagine the backlash I received for teaching actual science. When teaching at this school and introducing science concepts based on evidence, I encourage my students to be scientists. Question, question, question. I was constantly questioned about my belief, and while I observed those that claimed to be Christian not upholding Christian ideals, they judged others, they blamed the poor, they disliked outsiders and did not accept them. They labeled me an atheist and placed me as an outsider because I taught science. Day after day, I saw how horrible Christians Maybe fundamentalists were treating each other. I realized, I don't want to be like that. I don't even want to associate with people who act like that. I don't want to be a person that couldn't question. So I grew away from Christianity. But you know what? I'm still a good person. In fact, I had students that didn't believe in my classroom, knowing it was a safe place to question faith, and that it was okay not to know. I find solitude and peace not being held to a standard that doesn't have room for questioning. And it's not God that will be there. It's your community. It's the people that want to help you grow. We're the ones we've been waiting for. So that's the email I received. I find both this email and the sermon incredibly moving it's clear the listener has the ability to convey what they're feeling and thinking even when as you listen to the sermon you can notice that they're emotionally charged and perhaps a little nervous to be there but they can still portray these things i think that's a wonderful opportunity to talk and to share And I'm impressed that your journey has taken you where it has. And I'm sorry that the world can be as hard as it is. Unfortunately, you had to deal with things that put you in a place that made you uncomfortable. But luckily, that discomfort helped you change and helped you grow. Thank you for sending this to me. I want to remind everyone out there, if you have a story to share about your experiences with religion or culture or any of our societal structures that deserve deconstructing, deserve looking at, let me know. I'm not here to debate you. I'm not Matt Dillahunty. Now, yes, I might go after Kent Hovind because the stuff he was saying was kind of bananas. So unless you're going to come here with something that's indicatively harmful and indicatively deceitful, My goal is to let you speak about your experience taking apart what you believe as I take apart the things I believe to you. Thanks for listening. I can't wait to hear from the rest of you, and I will see you in April. This has been Fables of Our Deconstruction. Fables of Our Deconstruction is created by me, Dylan Jacobson. Don't forget... Leave a like and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also support me and all of my work and join my community, the Brimstone Order, at patreon.com slash Dylan. And remember, you're never alone. We are in this together. <laughs>